we are talking to Francis Itani, who is the author of The Company We Keep. And that's one of the books on this year's Gray County Reads. And actually, Francis has written 18 books. She's shortlisted for the Giller Prize and the Commonwealth Writers Prize. And she won the Commonwealth Writer Prize for the number one bestseller, Deafening. And she also won the CBC Literary Prize three times. She's the recipient of the Library and Archives of Canada Scholarship Award. And she's a member of the Order of Canada. And she teaches Tai Chi. So Francis, <laughs> welcome. It's Thank a pleasure you. to have you here. Um, oh. Before you were an author, though, Francis, you studied nursing and you became an ICU nurse. And it's a pretty dedicated one with all your postgraduate study at a number of universities and hospitals. And then there was a transition out of nursing that happened. And you went for a BA in psychology and a master's in English. I was wondering, was this transition easy? Was it a natural one? Some pull precipitated by a crisis? Uh, how did it come about? Well, certainly there was no crisis at all. I was working away as a, as a registered nurse. I was teaching nursing, um, but I uh, wanted to do more schooling. I, I love being at university. So I decided to go back and start working on an arts degree. And while I was doing that, I happened to move to Edmonton um, because my I and by then I was married. I had one baby when we moved to Edmonton. Um, ended up having another one there. Um, but while I was moving to Edmonton, I was looking up coursework and I decided to see if I could get into W.O. Mitchell's class um, in Edmonton at U of A because I was working on my arts degree anyway. And I had stopped nursing, oh, maybe just a year or two before because I had a small baby. Um, I love the profession. The profession of nursing is about human behavior. It's about hmm, people at their most vulnerable. It's about the human condition. I don't, I don't really see any difference between the two professions, to tell you the truth, except perhaps writing is more difficult. I think, yes, writing is difficult. I'm sure um, it is. It, uh, it requires a great deal of self-motivation, I'm sure. They say that um, the majority of uh, startup businesses fail because people just can't keep their nose to the grindstone. So congratulations on that. Um, but when writing became, shall we say, your day job, um, did your life change dramatically? Did, uh, were you under pressure from agents, publishers? Did you have a, a writing schedule? Did they make you show up with so many pages a day? Not at all. No, and I, I'm a very disciplined person. Um, I'm organized, I'm organized, I'm disciplined. I have no trouble whatever, um, you know, working away, working every day. I, I work all the time, you know, as much as I can. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm a hard worker. I love to work, but I also love to learn. So, you know, this combination of being a writer and researching for my books and, uh, I, you know, it's just something I love to do, but I do that all the time. I'm, I'm really disciplined. And you certainly are. You've written 18 books. Well, I have, yes. Yeah. But now, they're not... 18 mysteries. They're not 18 romance novels. They have a really diverse subject matter, which appears to bring you joy because you love to research, I know. And you've said every book is a personal journey. So can you tell us how you arrived at the choice of what you want to write? You've spoken of following a voice. Well, I mean, at the beginning, when I was first starting to write, I, I had two babies. So I, was, I studied with W.O. Mitchell. I studied with Rudy Weed out in Alberta um, before moving again to Ontario and then to New Brunswick, where I studied with Fred Cogswell, who was my, my um, thesis supervisor when I was doing my graduate work in English literature. And um, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to... Uh, I mean, at the beginning, because I had small children, I had just only so many hours. I was doing two degrees at night. And so I was writing poetry 
uh, my first book was, in fact, yes, a poetry book and a children's book. And in fact, I published three books of poetry before I published short stories. But I had, it's not because I have a short attention span, not at all. It's because I only had so many hours in the day when I could work at my writing. And I think it would have been so frustrating for me to try to hold a novel in my head when I was doing all of these other things. I, that's why I think I delayed getting into the novel. So I was always, you know, choosing subjects that really interested me, of course, but and I, and I wouldn't write about something that didn't really interest me or that I was going to have fun with or something that meant a great deal to me um, because I have to live with that for quite a long time. With a novel, I have to live with that in my head for you know, anywhere from four to six years. But I was writing shorter pieces and, shorter, and short stories. I did five collections of short stories um, before I you know, wrote Deafening, which was actually my first novel. So, and now I can, I do have the luxury of being able to hold a whole novel in my head at the same time. So now I'm, you know, working pretty much exclusively on novels, but, but not totally, because I'm also working on children's books and I'm halfway through a story collection, in fact. Wow. Um, yes, you certainly take your time with every book. Um, uh, it's years, in fact, and I know you spend a huge amount of time in research in the company you keep you interviewed your friends about grief and you research parrots and always in your work you you have mentioned that there must be music and there must be art as well but what is the whole process what goes on in those years between first idea and a completed manuscript what's what's the day to day surely you're not sitting at a at a desk the whole time. This must not involve more of your research. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not at a desk, you know, all the time. In fact, I'm sometimes just standing at the window, you know, looking out. Um, when I start out, I, you know, it's with an idea or an image, maybe a theme. I mean, everything I, you know, all of my work has to develop around theme, but I might not know the exact theme at the very beginning, at the, at the outset of a novel. And, and of course it can change as I go along. And the same for a short story. Um, but I, I usually started out by hand because there's some, you know, there's some old mechanism there that works for me because I used to write everything by hand in scribblers and you know, write on one side, leave the, the other page blank for editing as I went along and when I came back. And even though I work on computer now, I still start most of my books by hand just to get some ideas going and see if I can work out a character or get a situation. And then I very rapidly move onto computer and start figuring out um, the decisions. There are very definite decisions a novelist has to make at the outset of a book. Oh. Um, you know, temporal decisions, you know, characters, structure. Structure is so important. Time is so important. Am I going to set this thing in six months, three days, you know, one day, um, you know, 10 years, 20 years, four generations, as in uh, remembering the bones? Like, it's really important to establish that, but that takes a lot of muddling around and muttering around, um, you know, before I get that right, maybe in the first month or so, um, that happens. And, uh, and then I start working out my characters and adding or deleting as I go along. Um, okay. So I'm just all, it's always in my mind. When I reach a point where I'm in fact dreaming about my characters, this doesn't happen right away. It doesn't happen for actually more than a year in, maybe two years in. Um, when they're starting to have conversations in my head, in my dreams, I just get up in the morning and I think, ah, oh, I've got my book. That's amazing. I, I, I do love the way you speak like a gardener when you talk about your characters. You said as, as the characters start to grow, as if it's <laughs> not up to you at all. Yeah. <laughs> I love well, that. Did you know that, um, uh, speaking of your structure, the Google searches for how to write a book have doubled since 2019. Wow. I'm sure that's because of uh, COVID. And uh, the number one question that is, that is asked is, do you just start writing or do you plan everything out ahead of time? So I'm sure each writer is, is probably different in that regard. 
but uh, um, the research that you do seems to be half the joy for you of, of writing a book. Would that be right? I absolutely never plan a book in advance. Never, never, never. It would just kill it for me. It would absolutely kill it. I have to let it just develop as I go along, thinking about it all the time, you know, liking my characters, choosing names for them that mean something, giving them professions. You know, I, I, I just like I just really do mutter around like, <laughs> you know, I just I, I talk to myself all the time. Um, oh, it would so kill a book for me if I planned if I planned a book and decided how many chapters or what it would be about or what. You know, right. Plot like uh, there's no plot to any of my books. I work from theme. Uh, I want some really important theme. I want something to matter in my books. And so, and why are we having all these people suddenly write books? I mean, everybody has a voice, right? I guess everybody wants yeah. to have that, let that voice be heard. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, um, what about your life as a writer? You've mentioned the your two kids. Um, oh, and here's something else, Francis, before I get into your children. There's just a passing reference to eloping with your husband. Now, did that involve ladders and second story windows or <laughs> what happened there? Almost, <laughs> almost. My husband is Japanese Canadian and we've been together 53 years. And oh. in the 1960s, when we were married in Montreal, it was very for much frowned upon and uh, not at all done to have mixed marriages. So we just decided to elope. It just made things easier all the way around. And then we just announced it. Good for you. Saved yourselves a lot of money on weddings, I'm sure. That's what I keep telling my kids anyway. Yeah. Tell them to I, elope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it'd be a good plan. Um, Oh, what was I going to ask you? Oh, yeah. Um, family life. My wife is an actor and uh, she leaves me with the kids uh, occasionally when she goes to the other end of the country to work. Uh, we found that like very beneficial for all of us, for the kids in terms of bonding and traveling, seeing the country. Um, and you certainly uh, traveled extensively uh, doing workshops and and and. Uh, well, just being artist in residence. I wonder if, if the dynamic that I mentioned is, was similar in, in your family. Did, did the kids come to see you when you were moving around or um, were well, they? Well, my children, I always put my children first. Um, my husband had a job that, um, we both still work full time, by the way. He's 81 and he's working full time. And I'm in my seventies and working full time, except my husband has unfortunately recently had a really traumatic accident. And so that is not, you know, so that's one of the things I'm dealing with now. In our normal lives, uh, when our children were, were little, um, he was away a lot. So I was often a single parent. So um, it mattered to me that my children came first. I wanted children and uh, they absolutely took priority over anything that I was doing. Even, yeah. you know, even through exams, even through, you know, deadlines and whatever, I just had to cope. I had to work it out. And um, so I did a lot of that myself, even though, of course, the children are very close to their father, but he was often away. You know, sometimes he'd be away for six months. Uh, one time he was away for two and a half years. That was after the children grew up mm -hmm. uh, because he worked for the International Red Cross and the uh, ICRC and the uh, Red Cross Red Crescent for human for humanitarian work and natural disasters. So he would be away, for instance, when the tsunami came, he was gone. He was gone for six months. When the Pakistan had the earthquake and the flood, he was gone for a year. You know, I mean, that's what his life has been. And he's done very, very important and very valuable work internationally. So I always, I'm the one who's, who holds the fort. It's just always been that way. But our children are, of course, now grown up. Um, but I'm, I'm the one who, uh, who stayed at home and um, despite the fact that I was, you know, did what I could as a writer and accepted as many invitations as I could. And certainly I can move about now as, as I wish. Um, but, but that was my priority and it was my responsibility. Uh, that's wonderful. And then you moved them to Heidelberg. 
Oh, well, that was with Ted, my husband. Uh, he had a job with the NATO, with NATO uh, yes, with NATO at that time. I'm pretty sure it was NATO. And we, were, we lived there for three years. Yeah, that was wonderful. I mean, this is one good thing about being a writer. A writer can just pick up the notebooks. By, and then at that time, I was writing everything by hand. I did have a typewriter shift over, but, but, I, uh, but, but you know, a writer can move anywhere. I mean, I can live anywhere and still keep working unless I have to drag you know, to three or four boxes of research along, which I don't do. Um, so I, you know, I stay put when it's a heavily, heavily researched book. Right. But in Heidelberg, Heidelberg was wonderful. My children were seven and nine when we moved there. And we were there for three years and we toured around. We, you know, traveled every weekend. I wrote during the daytime while they were at school. They were at a very small American school, uh, a very small, actually Canadian school with 21 kids on an American base. I didn't live on a base or anything like that. I lived in a little tiny village. Um, but life was very good to us in Heidelberg. That was a wonderful posting. And I loved living in Germany. And I learned the language there. That's terrific. And your children, I guess, are learned it as well to a degree? Uh, to some degree. But I'm, I'm the one who was running the household in German, in the German language. Everybody else had English. You know, my children had an English school. I mean, I made them speak German when we were out traveling because I wanted them to learn as much as possible. Um, and they were learning some French at school. But when they came home, when we came back to Canada in 1983, uh, they both went straight, you know, and my daughter into uh, French immersion. And my son studied, he's a musician in Denmark right now in Copenhagen. He's with the Danish National Symphony. And he um, studied music in French language. So um, they both, you know, our whole family, is able to pick up languages pretty easily. Well, yes, you've, you've certainly lived in so many countries. Um, so your son's a musician, which um, might explain the Itani Family Award for flute. Oh, that's Could you yes. Tell us a bit about yes. that. Yes, I set that up because he, uh, Russell, our son, had such lovely years with the uh, Ottawa Youth Orchestra Academy, and John Gomez was the maestro at that time. And I wanted to uh, honor other flute students, flute or piccolo, um, in the winds department. And so I set up that award in perpetuity, more or less, for, oh, that's great. for a young flautist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I must shout out to all the other uh, humanitarian work you've been doing by giving back. Uh, you're uh, working with Big Sisters and the MS Society, Habitat for Humanity. Did you build a house? Yeah. Well, I worked on a house, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Uh, and um, the Ottawa Deaf Centre, uh, you're on the board there, which I yes. guess is uh, as a result of uh, researching deafness that led you to learn sign language as well. Well, when I was beginning to write deafening, I, when I made the commitment, um, I, I thought, okay, there has to be a deaf community here in Ottawa. And if there is, I do not know the people who belong to it. So I just got onto the phone and phoned around and you know, contacted the Canadian Hearing Society and then found out there was a center called the Ottawa Deaf Center here. So I immediately volunteered to be a volunteer. I mean, this was not easy. I had to sit at a desk and be the person, you know, people greet, I was the one who greeted people as they came through the door of this great big house where many, many activities went on and many learning situations and teaching and so on. And you know, people would come in and you know, do they would speak to me in sign language, and I was just learning sign language, so I had to study it very quickly. I had, I think, about four teachers, three deaf teachers, and one hearing teacher. So I was learning as quickly as I could, but it was frustrating for sometimes not only for me, but for people, deaf people who were entering the building and were trying to tell me something, you know, with their hands. So, you know, I I uh, I stayed on with them for several years until in fact it closed and became very involved and uh, had many and do have, you know, deaf friends now. And, uh, oh, just got so involved. I loved working with the community and being part of the community. And, the, and I was accepted, by the way, the reason I was accepted in, into the community um, be, is because my grandmother um, was deaf. So this, this is the sign for mother grandmother, great grandmother, and so on as you grow. But because my grandmother was deaf um, and not hearing, which is the sign for hearing, I was considered family. 
So I was just pulled into the flock and I became part of that community. That, and all the and you kept writing deafness throughout that. I was working on deafening, yes. And then I you know, started to do the war. You know, by the time I decided to add in World War I, I was already four years into the book. And I thought, oh boy, like if I include World War I in this, it's gonna add another two years. And it did. And I, you know, I went to visit the battlefields and started interviewing. There were still a few veterans alive from World War I at that time. And, um, but it was, oh, that was, that book was such a journey for me. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad I took that journey. Oh, yeah. I, I can't imagine. Uh, it's a beautiful book. Um, what, I just want to go back. The sign for hearing has, what is that? It means speaking. Isn't that interesting? That is really interesting, yeah. Speaking person means a hearing person. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to stay off discussing uh, a lot about your book because we have an advocate for you who's going to be doing that. But I, I would like to know that the company we keep has seven characters, including Rico the parrot. Yes. How do you structure this? So your character, um, Hasley, puts up a notice and four people respond. Did all four respond at, at once in your mind? Like, did, did one character come after the other? Because you said you started writing about the parrot. So as, the, as you progressed, did one character arrive, then another, then another, and then you adjusted to make all four? Because it seems like a, quite a challenge to, uh, to have four in your head and at the get-go. It was a huge challenge. And I started, I, first of all, I wanted, um, mix, I wanted mixed gender. I wanted different age groups. Then I thought, okay, well, you know, let's start with Hasley. Hasley's of a certain age. And then um, she puts up the notice and who's going to respond. And then I was thinking, okay, how about somebody in their 40s? How about somebody in their 50s or 60s? Maybe someone around her own age in, in the 70s. And, um, and then of course there's a, a sixth character who is added later on. And he actually, I mean, it's hard to, for me to believe this, but by the time I had set up Tom and decided that Tom would be an antique dealer, um, I had Tom sitting in his store one day and, and a Syrian refugee walked in off the street. I mean, I'm not kidding. It just, that happened in my head. And I remember sending an email to my editor and saying, oh, a Syrian refugee just walked in off the street into the antique store of one of my characters. She didn't know like what my story was yet. And I said, so now I have an extra character. So, you know, in the middle of the book, here is a Syrian refugee. And normally one is introduced to characters um, pretty much close to the beginning, but, but Alam was introduced in fact later. And, and I really liked that character. And, I, and then of course I had to research, you know, Syrian languages various things. And, right. But the setting up of the structure for that, um, to me, the big challenge for me, and I've never done this before, not to this extent, was having six characters plus a parrot, six, human, six humans plus a parrot, and um, each had to have his or her own story, um, do something, you know, start from a starting point to an, to an end point, but also all together as a total, the six and Rico, seven, the parrot, um, they had to have an overall arching story. So right. that's, I was working with six individual stories and one overall totality, story of totality. So that was my big challenge. And I just, I love it the challenge. So I just worked it out. I, I said to my editor, you know, I'm doing this sort of strange thing. But I said, I can do it. And she said, Francis, I have absolutely no doubt whatever that you can do it. <laughs> so, you know, just left up to me for the next two or three years to do it. <laughs> Are you lucky that way in terms of, of editor, uh, agent, uh, and the 
the free reign they give you, there, there doesn't seem to be a time constraint. I wouldn't, I don't know from uh, publishing contracts or anything like that, but uh, there doesn't appear to be any delivery date required. Uh, that is not true, actually. I do have, uh, I usually sign two book contracts with HarperCollins, so I do have delivery dates, but I make them reasonable. And I have a great agent, Jackie Kaiser, and a great editor, uh, Jennifer Lambert. Uh, prior to that, it was Phyllis Bruce until she moved over to Simon and & Schuster. And Phyllis and I did about seven books together, I think. And Jennifer and I have done two or three together now. And, um, oh, they give me a total free reign. I mean, not to do with contract. I always meet my contract, so that's not an issue. Uh, this year might be a little bit different because COVID has changed everything. However, um, we switched books, you know, in during COVID because the company we keep was supposed to be the second of this particular two book contract. But we just decided to bring that one out first. And it's so interesting that in fact, to me, um, it speaks to what's going on now, which was entirely unplanned, of course. Oh, doesn't it though? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's timely for you too, in a way, because we're all re reaching that age where one by one, our friends are dropping off. Grief and sadness is becoming a, a part of our lives, unfortunately, but that's- Well, it is, but fortunately, my book is also my, you know, about hope and about oh, connect yeah. connections you know, among people. And it's just ironic that I have to do all of my book events virtually. You know, my book, which is about getting together <laughs> and about people supporting one another, I have to do everything in total isolation and my audience is all, you know, isolated as well. And it's just, it's just such irony. Yeah. But you've, uh, you've recently written a, a short story about COVID, have you not? I have, yes. I haven't, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually still revising it thematically. But yes, I've written quite a, quite a long story. Well, it's long, it's five or 6,000 words. Um, and I'm still like debating what I'm going to do with this, with it thematically. Yeah. It, I mean, it has to really count for something. Yeah. 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 That would be difficult as we have uh, variants coming in all the time. They're throwing new characters at you for that, whether you like it or not, aren't they? That's yeah. something. Um, oh, oh, here's another one from the, from the, uh, from the net, how to write a book. How do you break a writer's block is the question. Now, is there even such a thing as a writer's I, block? Not for me. No, I never have writer's block. I just simply never do. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't even, I wouldn't even consider it. it would probably like stop me in my tracks if I started thinking about that. Um, my God, I have enough on my plate to worry about and to think about and to do and my profession and oh Lord. A uh, writer's block, no. When I was working with W.O. Mitchell, when I was just starting out, I remember saying to him, because I was only working on story, I shouldn't say only, because stories are very important. Uh, it's a wonderful genre, with, which I love. Um, but I remember saying to him, okay, I'm working on stories. You're always writing a novel. How do you get up in the morning and manage to, to sit down and face a whole great big novel? And he just looked at me and he said, you go where, you, where it grabs you the most. And I've never forgotten that advice. And it's just the best advice. I mean, if I come to my computer and I can't stand working on, you know, whatever's in front of me, I flip to another chapter. I go to the end. I write the ending. I write the middle. I, you know, I go somewhere else. I work with another character. I, there's always something that's a challenge to work with. But I never work on something I don't like working on because what's the point of forcing it? It'll just be bad writing. Well, that's so interesting. There's no, there's no notion of nose to the grindstone of pushing through the tough parts, you're saying. Oh, oh no, I'm not saying that at all. Oh my goodness. No, every, every book you know, has problems. Every story has huge problems. And the writer has to write her or his way through those problems. Um, but for me, that's like an, that's kind of an end game, you know, um, when I'm just getting the book together and starting to, you know, make parts work with one another and getting characters to interact and have conversations and moving them from place to place. Um, that's a very different kind of writing from solving the problems 
editorially at the end. I mean, I can edit my own work and, and I'm good at that. It's one of my strengths. So, oh no, but that's definitely writing through the problems. I know how to do that. I love that part, but that doesn't come till much further on. That, that's my favorite time in a book. It's the last year, but especially the last six months of the book. And that's what keeps me writing all those years to get there because I know how pleasurable that is. It's just an amazing, it just provides me with so much happiness to get to that last six months. And then I just love solving the problems and editing and peeling back and making it tight and, you know, paring it down to the bone. And, you know, that's my favorite time. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but I got to tell you that I loved uh, your radio play, Keeper of the Cranes. Oh, from how so did you long get that? ago. Yes. I was working at, uh, at uh, Jarvis Street Studios at the time, and uh, my good friends were in it Franny Hyland and David Hemblin. And uh, yeah, it was really, I, I was, I, I didn't recognize your name at the time. I was, young self-interested it was all about me but uh, I certainly do remember the uh, the, the play well, I, I was just starting out and Jean Bartels that was the last play that Jean Bartels produced for CBC it was that full hour wonderful time when you know dramas were done radio dramas were done for a full hour and yeah. uh, she she believed in that play and she believed in me and uh, I've been lucky to, you know, meet up with people who did believe in me, like W. O. Mitchell, right? Who became a very, very close friend, and very dear oh, friend. Nice. Yeah, and wonderful he, fellow. I'm now really close friends with his son, Orm, and uh, Orm's wife, uh, Barb, um, who live in Peterborough. But Jean Bartels believed in this play and she wanted to do it, you know, do it right. And she had great actors in it. And yeah, yeah. That, was, that was such a lovely experience for me. Certainly the golden days of radio back yeah. then. Peter Zosky had radio plays every morning. It was a terrific time. It was. I'll, I'll let you go now. I know you have to uh, get on to your next Zoom meeting, but it's a little easier than having to leave the house, I suppose, sometimes. So um, thank you so much for this time. Um, after we've all had our shots and take off our masks, I'll come to, uh, I'll come to Ottawa and I'll take you out to brunch. Oh, let's do that. I love French. Let's do that. Yes. Sounds and thank like you. I love being here. And I hope you will tell me who's defending my book. Who, who will it be? Oh, yeah. It's um, his uh, name is J.D. Moffat, and he's the morning show host on I'm looking up the number. Yeah, it's 99.3. It's the it's the uh, radio in Meaford. Oh, okay. Uh, which is right on Georgian Bay. Beautiful spot. Sounds great. OK, well, well thank you so host. much. Um, everybody, uh, you have to go to uh, Francis's website at uh, francisitani.com. Uh, there's a lot more fascinating stuff about her, and uh, you can follow uh, everything else on um, Gray County Reads, as so can you, Francis. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Much appreciated. Bye. Bye. Bye.